Well, good morning. Glad you're joining us at Germantown Christian Center. And uh, with that, we'll just encourage you to relax, sit back. We're going to spend some time with the Word of God. And this Communion Sunday at our church is an opportunity for us to celebrate Christ, to remember or remind yourselves of God's faithfulness, His love, how much He adores us, and how much we adore Him. Amen. So we encourage you just to sit back, take your Bibles out, and let's get in the Word of God today. If you have your Bibles, turn up with me, if you don't mind, to the book of Numbers chapter 21. Numbers, the 21st chapter. Now, whenever you start looking and you say, you know, the book of Numbers, I remember back in the day when I was, uh, uh, you know, in, in Bible, Bible school and all that, that we, we had a situation where you, you studied the different books of the Bible. And I remember studying Numbers. And, of course, Numbers, for the large part, was a lot of numbering. And, I, you know, and of course you say, well, I thought there'd be no math. Well, sometimes there is math. But when you get to some things, you, there are some things in the book of Numbers that remind you about that, that God has an order, a purpose to everything. Details matter with God. And so sometimes we lose sight of the fact that God is very detail-oriented. When he says something, he knows how to bring it to pass. When he states this is his will, he fully intends to go ahead and develop it in your life. So God will tell you sometimes some things he wants you to do. And he has the ability to help you bring them and see them to come to fruition. Well, here in Numbers 21, we have a little story that is recounted to us that maybe you have read before. He said in verse 4 of Numbers 21, it says, They traveled, as it were, talking about the children of Israel, from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea, and they went around a place called Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. Well, basically, we've all been there before. If you've traveled with kids, you've heard these words, are we there yet, Right? I mean, that's just normal. That's just part of life. Well, this is what's happening here. And so they start getting a little impatient. And, then, you know, when you get impatient, you start getting a little murmuring at times. And if you add a little bit of hungry to it, then you get hangry. And that's obviously a realm that you don't need to go into. Well, then they spoke against God and against Moses. And they said, why have you, notice you, Moses, brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? They have problems now. They've allowed their attitude to get the best of them. And folks, you and I both know that the biggest thing that we can do to, to help allow God to navigate the events of our life well is to keep your attitude in check. If you and I as a believer don't have a good attitude, you ever notice it's a lot harder to, to see the hand of God move in your life and acknowledge it and give Him praise for it. You ever notice that if you allow your mouth to get the best of you, your attitude to get the best of you, oftentimes you're not looking for the, for the little breadcrumbs that God is leaving before you that you're supposed to be picking up and following after. Have you ever noticed that? Well, here's what happened here. They started complaining against Moses. Then they said, there is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Now, what miserable food are they detesting? They're talking about, about the, the manna that God is creating and making them. Folks, I would never really ever complain about food someone else is making for me that I'm not paying for. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, there's times my wife, this past week, all of a sudden I start smelling something. She says, I said, Are you, what's going on? She goes, oh, I, I put together, uh, I had some chicken that had to be cooked. So she put together a casserole. And so she had some chicken that was plain, and then she had some chicken she put in there with some uh, casserole she calls chicken and rice. Yeah, I know. How, why does she call it chicken and rice? Well, because there's chicken and there's rice in it. So it just seems like a good idea to call something chicken and rice. That's what it is. And so I said, well, that's great. She said, well, you don't have to eat it if you want to. I said, no, I'm, I, that's great. And so when it was ready, she, you know, so whatever, that's, that, that was her dinner. You know, I, I didn't complain about it now. You say, well, yeah, chicken rice is good. When someone just pops up and makes it for you, that's even better, isn't it? When someone cleans the dishes afterwards, that's like heaven. There you go. And so Israel, though, is complaining about food that is being made for them that they don't even pay for. Man, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a special kind of cray-cray right there, I'm telling you. Then he says there in verse 6, then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. Now, I know some people get all bent out of shape. If you look it up, it literally is saying that God allowed. What are there in the desert? Are there snakes in the desert? Yes. 
What we lose sight of the fact is that if you walk in line with the will of God, if you allow and understand, like we looked at last week, Psalm 91, there is an air of protection around believers if you, if you believe for it. If you walk outside of the will of God, you walk outside of His will. You walk outside of His will, you're walking outside oftentimes of His ability to protect you as He desires, as He wants. It's like a mom and a dad want to protect their kids, but if they willingly go out and do something that is not, not, not what they've been trained, not what they've been taught, even against what they know they should do, then they are, there's going to be consequences to those actions. Not that you want them, you have, you have done everything you can to put them in a position to succeed, but that does not mean they will succeed. They still have to cooperate and buy into it. As believers, we need to buy into it. We need to have our faith and develop and say, Father, I trust you. I'm following you. I give you glory, and I know you got my best concern at the dearest portions of your heart. You want me to follow after you because you know what's best for me. So I give you credit for knowing that. You see, what, what Israel got is they started letting their feelings and emotions get the best of them, and they start saying, this is what I want. This is what I need. This is what I deserve. And so, sadly, when you start doing that, you're walking outside of the will of God. They start complaining against Moses. They start backbiting and murmuring against God. And as a result, that protection waned. They moved outside of it. I like putting it this way. If you ever gotten un underneath an umbrella in the sun, you're in the shade. Doesn't take very far to walk, and you're no longer under the sun. If you get outside of that umbrella, that sun beats down on you, and the effects are real. See, oftentimes it's not like a mile that we walk out, out of the will of God. Oftentimes it's just the wrong step. And if you'll notice this, the longer you stay with Christ, the longer you stay and live for the Lord, the longer you follow after Him, that umbrella gets smaller and smaller. When you first get saved, that umbrella is about the size of the Superdome. But as you start walking in line with him and you start developing and maturing, all of a sudden the size of that umbrella and the shadow that it casts is smaller and smaller and smaller. And so when we get down there and say, they they abide under the shadow of the Most High, guess what, folks? That shadow gets a little smaller and smaller and smaller as you start tuning in and following after God all these years because you're responsible for more because you know more. Amen? And so here's Israel, and they had snakes. And they started being bitten, venomous snakes. Then, of course, verse 7 says, the people came to Moses and said, we've sinned against, uh, we have sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Well, at least they were repentive. Then they said, Moses, pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. And Moses replied, I'm not praying for y'all. Is that what he said? No. What did he, he prayed, didn't he? So Moses prayed for the people. Then the, the Lord said to Moses, okay, make a snake, put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake, put it up on a pole, and then when anyone was bitten by the snake, all he had to do was look at the bronze snake and he lived. And he said, well, what does this story have to do with communion? Well, actually quite a bit. Because you see and don't understand that this snake on a pole, as it were, is a type, as it were, of Christ on the cross. And, of course, I know what happened, as it were, many, many years before Christ would actually give his life for us on the cross of Calvary upon Golgotha's hill. But the fact of the matter is, this was Jesus, as it were, revealed, as it were, even to the, to the, to the Israelites as being the one that was going to save them, that was going to deliver them, in this case, save them from the afflictions of the enemy. As believers, we know that we can look now at the cross and look back those Israelites didn't have that. They were looking forward. They had promises God made, but they were notes and promissory notes that God would have to keep in the future. We as believers can look back and say, God fulfilled his word. God fulfilled his promise. And so we don't have to worry about putting up and setting up a bronze snake in the desert, looking at it as it were, because we can look back at Jesus on the cross and say, my sins were paid for when he accepted my debt on the cross of Calvary. When he willingly gave his life as a gift for me, he took my sins and my sicknesses and my diseases and my frailties and all the inadequacies of my life. He took them, as it were, nailed them on the cross. He took my burdens, and in turn, he gave me his reward. It's pretty awesome, folks. I said, that's pretty awesome. I don't know. Somehow I would think that I know we've become jaded at times, but I'm going to tell you something. There's still something to be excited about the blood of Jesus. 
there's still something to be excited about the cross of Calvary. Don't ever get to the place where you become so blasé at that which cost the life of God's only begotten Son who had to die for you and me to taking our place so that we might receive eternal life. He goes, otherwise we were destined for eternal death. And instead we have eternal life with God in heaven. I don't know. I think there's something to get excited about. Don't you? I mean, think about it. You don't have to go to hell. And so I think sometimes we can look back and we can say, well, this story reminds us of some things that we need to be careful of about as well. When we look at, at receiving communion in a few moments, we're looking at Jesus. But let's not fall into the trap of the Israelites. Let's not look at the circumstances and become jaded by what God is doing. Let's not complain and murmur when we ought to rejoice and give Him praise. Because all that does is open ourselves up to things that we don't need to have in our lives. Does that make sense? I mean, think about it. What are you praying 1 John 1, 9 for in your life? I don't, want, I don't want to hear about it, okay? But what is it that you're praying 1 John 1, 9 in your life about? You know? 1 John 1, 9, you say, what does 1 John 1, 9 say? If we only had somebody that knew that. Ver Stephanie, what does 1 John 1, 9 say? Is she right? Yeah. That if you will confess your sin before God, He is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So if you make a mistake, and let me just say, when you make a mistake, not if, when you make a mistake, you can go to God and, and ask Him to forgive you, and what does He do? He forgives you. And I love this part, and then He just wipes the slate clean and doesn't remember it anymore. I don't know about you, that's pretty good, isn't it? I said, isn't it? How many of you know that God, God has a way of, of doing things that's better than what people do? How many of you have forgiven somebody before, but not forgotten it? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I, I, I've heard people say, well, I'll forgive them, but I ain't forgetting it. Well, then you haven't really forgiven, have you? Because if you keep putting it in the forefront of your, of your mind, that, that which, which is between you, is going to affect your fellowship and relationship, isn't it? What God does is He doesn't just forgive you and, and, and let it remain there. He forgives you and then forgets about it. So there's nothing including His view of you, His inside of you, His opinion of you, His desire to help you. That's pretty awesome, folks. You say, well, yeah, I know that. Well, then thank Him for that. Encourage yourself in that deal because 1 John 1 9 is good. But if we're praying a lot of the 1 John 1 9, we need to look at ourselves and realize that maybe there's some things we can do to be able to overcome the challenges that, 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 that caused us to have to pray 1 John 1 9. I like putting it this way. Remember, remind yourself the cross of Calvary doesn't provide just forgiveness of your sins, but the ability to walk as a king's kid. The ability to walk beyond and above the circumstances of your life. In other words, if something is try constantly tripping you up, ask God and say, Father, I thank you that the blood of Jesus didn't just forgive me, but helps elevate me too. Helps allow me to ascend above the life that I had and the life that I now enjoy because of you. Let him help you to lift you up and overcome these struggles because guess what? God is able. Isn't that right? So the cross of Calvary does forgive you of your sins, but he can also help you so that you can overcome the things so that you don't have to be praying about those things. In other words, I like doing this. Let's, let's overcome the things that are tripping us up today to get to the things that are going to start tripping us up tomorrow. Because there's some things out there that need to be addressed. He's not even mentioning to us yet. Because we're still dealing with this. Let's, let's get victory in this area so we can start dealing with this stuff over here. That's how we go from glory to glory day by day. None of us are perfect, are we? No, of course not. But I tell you, we can sure get better off than we were yesterday. Shouldn't we? And, and so we ought to be encouraged. So you say, well, how do I stop doing it? Don't, don't get yourself into a bad attitude, murmuring and complaining about circumstances of your life. If anything, go to God. Don't go to man. You know what I'm talking about? 
If you want, if you're tempted to complain to somebody, why don't you start go ahead and talking to God first? And then you find yourself a whole different attitude adjustment. Isn't that right? So, so where do we go from here? Let, let, let's encourage you about some things. You know, in life, you and I has an opportunity every single day to basically walk in a level above what we did yesterday. And that is only possible because of the glory and the power of God. And so we don't need to get in the habit of murmuring and complaining. And I know that we keep hitting this point, but folks, the world is full of people who are so negative who can pick out everything that's wrong. And in doing that, you forget to be able to acknowledge all that is good. For the Lord is good and His mercy endureth forever. If all we're doing is picking apart and seeing the negative, it's really hard to be able to glorify God and all of His good. Does that make sense? I mean, think about it. If all you do is pick the negative, pick the negative, pick the negative, and you're never going ahead and looking at things through the possibility and the role of faith, then you're cheating yourself an opportunity to see God for who He is and what He can do. I believe God is able. And you've got to ask yourself, do you? Do you believe that your God, not, not, not just my God, your God is able? Well, then thank Him, praise Him, acknowledge it. Give Him something to work with. Say, Father, take hold of my life and make something of it every day. And, and folks, during your day, thank Him that He's working His good pleasure in you to bring Him glory and to bring Him honor. Right? Now, what are the problems? If you murmur, you're opening the door to the devil. Pure and simple. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 puts it this way. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed as serpents. Neither murmur you, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the story. In other words, we are being told here that we shouldn't murmur, complain. Limit your, 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 limit your, your viewpoint, your perspective on your life. And start looking for God's outpouring of glory, mercy, and truth. It's very easy to pick things apart that's wrong. It's a lot harder to be able to look through the, the muck and mire of the world and see where the hand of God is flowing and what He wants you to do with it. Folks, we've got too many people in this world wallowing in sin. And they're looking for a life raft, a lifeboat, looking for a life ring. We as believers are in this world to provide that to them. And we need to be able to navigate that and see who is drowning amongst us. Sometimes you're not careful, you become so consumed with all the stuff of the world that you forget the most important mission, and that is there are folks that are drowning in their sins, dying and going to hell every day. That's the, that's the stark reality of, 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 of the life in which is today. Right? I mean, think about it. If you're out there, just imagine, let's say that you were, you were out there the day of the Titanic. And it's floating along and hits an iceberg. Okay? And so you're at the deck and all of a sudden as, the, as that's going on, there's a lot of turmoil and commotion, commotion that's going on. And you're up there and you say, I paid my first class ticket. I, I should have great service. What's going on here? People are running around, screaming and, and, and chaos everywhere. And you're complaining that the orchestra that is playing on the deck of the ship, is, 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 is they're, they're missing 10 people, and, and the brass section isn't as good, and, and, you're, and you're trying to get the captain to say, I demand a refund. The orchestra is not doing their, I mean, they're, 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 it's not as it was promised. Hey, folks, you're, you're forgetting something. The ship hit an iceberg. Your concern ought not be the tonal quality of the instruments that are playing. You ought to be looking for a lifeboat. In life, a lot of times we are consumed with things that really don't matter and are not important right now. And the devil wants it that way. He wants you to look at things that don't really matter so that you won't see what does. And so a lot of times in your life, if you're complaining and murmuring and all these things, you will become so myopic that you will not see what you should. And I think that if you look at Jesus, and that's why I just love, there's, there's, there's a lot of value to reading the Gospels. But one of the things I absolutely adore about Jesus, I mean, there's a lot, obviously for all of us. But the thing that gets me is that Jesus always saw what was most important. What I really, is, 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 and I, I've already taken from it, is I, I love how Jesus noticed things, but noticed people. 
He was busy doing something, but then he noticed somebody. He, he was able to determine God wanted to do something here in that person. And everything else going around, he stopped. And if you just read the Gospels in a way, and I, I've mentioned this before, in such a way, the number of times that Jesus stopped and noticed and talked to somebody, that really, he was, he was in the middle of something else. And he stopped. I know one of the, the stories that, which you all know, was this reason I, I can mention this one. In Mark 5, you all, you all know the woman with the issue of blood. He's, all, he's busy, you know, the Jairus got to him first, and he had to, you know, please come help me and the whole thing. And, and you know the story. And then in the middle of him saying, okay, let's go. This woman who it said had an issue of blood. In other words, she had something wrong with her blood. And of course, it said she had it for a long time, spent all her money, had, you know, basically had nothing left. Gave her money all to the physicians, and they didn't help her, and now she's penniless. She didn't have anything to, to left. And I love this, but when she heard of Jesus, that's a powerful statement there. But when she heard of Jesus, there's going to be things in your life that you heard of that changed your life. Right? I mean, Daryl, when you heard of Kathy, that changed your life, didn't it? For the good. That's right. When you heard of Kathy, it changed your life. Peter, when you heard of Stephanie, changed your life for the good. Right? There's going to be some relationships and things like that. We get that. But here's Jesus. He's walking around. He's a mission. He's got a purpose. Okay, we're, we're going to go see a manifestation of a miracle power of God. And he's walking. And all of a sudden, here's a woman, unbeknownst to anyone else around, who has an agenda. She said, I need, to, I need to get healed. And she heard something about Jesus. And what she heard was Jesus heals people. If you, if people that touch Jesus got healed. So she, her thing was, I'm going to touch Jesus and I'm getting my healing too. I don't know about you, but that, that's just, that's pretty gutsy. See, what you, what you need to realize too is this woman didn't have a right to do what she was doing. Number one, let's be honest, she was a woman. And back in that culture, they really were not elevated like they, like they are today and should be. And so then you compound that, that she had a disease. And there was a prescribed thing. She wasn't supposed to be in public. She wasn't allowed to be out in open air. She, she wasn't allowed to be this close. To, I mean, it was, there was a lot of rules against this. Yet there she was. But you know why? She had to make a decision. Do I follow the rules of man or do I follow what I know that I've heard about Jesus? And see, a lot of times you and I have to do the same thing in our lives. Are you going to live to the opinions of men or are you going to follow after the heart of God? A lot of people will put pressure on you to do certain things because it's what's expected of you. Maybe it's a family thing, a cultural thing. Maybe it's, you know, who knows, business thing. And you got to sometimes make a decision, I'm following after God because I'm living for him, not for you. Make sense? So this woman comes in there, and you know the story. She comes in and touches the hem of the garment of Jesus. And at that very moment, the most astounding thing that I think is so, so God is on his way right now, Jesus all of a sudden stopped and asked a simple question so that people could hear him. He said, who touched me? Who touched me? And his disciples didn't understand it because you have to understand something. They weren't, they weren't keyed in spiritually. They asked a simple question, what do you mean, Jesus? What, what are you doing? You're tripping here. Everybody's touching you. And Jesus, he was big. No, no, somebody touched me with their faith. You see, there's going to be a lot of people in your life that are going to draw from you. And they may have a motive about it. One thing about God is, his only motive is to help you. His motive is to, is to help you, not hurt you. Jesus was the personification of the will of God. And at that moment in time, he's walking and everyone's touching him. Everyone's, oh, man, yeah, 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 yeah. But there was one woman who really didn't have the right to be there in the eyes of men. And she touched him and Jesus immediately noticed and said, somebody touched me with their faith. And then he looked around to see who did this thing. 
And there's the woman who basically fell down and told Jesus, oh, it was me. Told her story. This is, you know. And Jesus said, no, your faith made you whole. Jesus the healer. Back in the desert, they put up a bronze snake. You looked at it. You gazed at it. You have to look at that word gaze. When it said those that gaze, it means those that looked at it steadfastly. In other words, you heeded, you looked, you understood. It wasn't one of these glances. It was you gaze, you acknowledge its meaning, its significance, and its power. That woman who came in was doing the same thing. She was acknowledging the power of God as she said, if I touch them, I get my healing. Now, I'll ask you a question. What kind of touching do you need today? to get your healing, to get your strength, to get whatever that it is. So for some, it'll be, I touch that element right there. That wafer, as I touch it and I put it in my hand, my faith says in the name of Jesus, I am made whole. Some people will go ahead and say, you know, as a point of contact, and it happened. I remember back in the day, you know, Or Roberts, many of you may have heard of Or Roberts before. He would, he would be on television a lot of times, and one of the things he would do is, is up there, miracle crusades. People getting healed marvelously. The outpouring of God's mercy. God is still powerful. God is still doing miracles today. But old Roberts would be on television. He says, a point of contact. Put your hand on top of the television set. And he said, as I pray, he said, as I pray, you, you, just, you receive your healing from God. It was a point of contact. It was like the woman of the issue of blood. Her faith was, I got to touch Jesus. And so he would say, you touch that television. As a point of contact, you pray. Folks, we do that every time when we're praying. How many know when you're praying to God, you're making a point of contact with God, aren't you? He, he may not be there in physical form with your eyes, but you know by faith, you, you, you pray, you're making a point of contact. Say, Father, I'm praying to you in the name of Jesus, aren't you? Because you have that relationship with him. See, today with communion, we're doing the same thing. You can sit there and say, Jesus lives in here by the Holy Ghost, lives in here. But as you take that element of, of that represents his body, that wafer, or that juice that represents his blood, that's your point of contact. And whether like the woman of the issue, blessed, if I touch Jesus, I'm getting my healing. The people there, as they were in the desert, they gazed, they looked, they beheld, and they got their healing. You could put your faith in your head. Father, as I take that wafer and I place it in my mouth in the name of Jesus, I receive of what you provided for me. Because it was by his stripes you were healed. 1 Peter 2, 24. Amen. Amen? These are opportunities we have as believers. And thank God they're good ones. Let me, let me close here and then we'll get in, into communion. Uh, glory to God. John chapter 3, verse 10. John chapter 3, verse 10. This is the NIV version of the Bible that I'm going to read from here. Beginning at verse 10 to verse 15, puts it this way. He says, you are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony? I have spoken to you of earthly things, and yet you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak to you of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man, that's Jesus. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must also be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Here, as it were, in the words of Jesus, he was letting himself be known and compared as God's plan, as it was even as the serpent was put up in the desert, so Jesus will be put on the cross. And as we beheld him, as we look to him, as we understand and behold that which Jesus did for us, it provides ever so much for us. He was the innocent lamb. Jesus was the innocent lamb. He took our place. The Israelites, they sinned, they murmured, they complained, they did, you know, they, they, they just... They would never acknowledge completely that God was taking care of them. It was always not good enough, not this, not that, not to their liking. And yet, God through it all was willing to make an opportunity to say, you know what, I forgive you if you ask. There is nothing anyone can do or has done 
that God cannot and will not forgive because he is a God that is more than enough. Amen? And, and so here we are now, and, and people say, well, but, but you don't know my circumstance. I don't have to. God does. And even knowing it, God said, you are forgiven. When Jesus on the cross of Calvary said, it is done. It was fully well knowing all about you. And he still said, I desire you in my family. And so I say all this just to remind you that Christ is our everything. Christ paid the price for all of, all, complete, fully, redemption. All your sins, all your sicknesses, all your diseases, all your frailties, inadequacies, everything else, all your fears, all your worries, Christ loves you. He's accepted you in the beloved. One of the greatest things that you and I as a believer will ever get a hold of is this simple truth, this simple reality, is that God knows everything about you, knows every intricate detail of your life, and knowing all of that still loves you. There is nothing you can hide from God. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, He doesn't know about you. And having all that knowledge, He still loves you. Isn't that cool? I mean, isn't that great? It's, it, 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 hey, listen, it's a whole lot better than the, the angst that some of you went through when you were dating. I mean, Daryl, we picked on you a moment ago. When you were dating Kathy, you put your best foot forward, weren't you? Yeah, Kathy's over there. Yeah, yeah. You put your best foot forward. You, 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 didn't, you didn't lead with your, fail, with your faults and failures. No. You probably led with the fact that you used to be a bull rider, right? That's, that's like the macho thing, right? That's something I'll never be able to say, and that's okay. You know, you used to be six foot four, and now you're, you know, anyway. But, but seriously, we, we all do that. We lead with our strengths because you want someone to like you. You know, I date my wife, you know, and I mean, she made it pretty obvious to think she was trying to, you know, she was trying to get me to like her and, you know, just really was, was, you know, pursuing after me, you know, she really, you know. Funny thing about it is, you know, we always, when we're dating, we always try to put our best foot forward, you know, and, and that's okay because you, you know, you, you don't lead with the things that you're not good at. Not if you want someone to like you. Problem is sometimes we take that in a relationship with God. You got to realize that God already knows everything about you. There's nothing you can hide from him. There's nothing that he doesn't already know. There's just things you're not willing to admit. And God loves you. That's why you can trust him. That's why you can just, you know. And so when you have that, you get more comfortable relationship and you realize that, then there's a, there's a, there's a, a peace. There's a, there's a, I don't say comfort, but there's a just, it just, just a peace about it all. And when you understand that God loves you that much and cares about you that much, everything else, and you, and you lay yourself bare before him, then when you have something going on, like, you know, you need healing or you need strength or you need wisdom or, or whatever, it, it's no big deal because you already know God already loves me and wants it for me. And it's easier to receive it because you're not trying to create an atmosphere of perfection, a bubble, as it were, of, 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 of you know, I'm good. Folks, God doesn't expect you to be perfect to earn his blessings. When you receive communion, it's not because you're perfect. It's because you're family. I mean, I know we, we got Thanksgiving coming up, don't we? And maybe you can think back in the day, maybe when you were younger, perhaps even when you had maybe more family around you and, and, and Thanksgiving dinner comes around, and you may have that particular family member maybe a brother or a cousin or a nephew, or whoever. And, and maybe they're somewhat estranged. Maybe you haven't seen them in a while. You know, maybe they're just boorish at holidays. But when it comes to Thanksgiving around, they're still invited. The table is still set. There's enough food for everybody. And so what happens is, sadly, we, we need to kind of get to the fact that God, when he sets his table before you, Everyone's invited. 
It's not because you were really good or really perfect or really good. No, it's just because you have the same last name. And folks, you're in the family of God. If you look around you right now, we all look different. Man, we got white folk, black folk, old folk, young folk, pretty folk, and other folk. <laughs> and the, the thing about it is, we're all in the same family. Amen. And I just think that's pretty awesome. And so, today I want to leave you with this. Check your attitude. Focus on what's important in life. Don't be someone criticizing the band, asking for a refund when you ought to be looking for a lifeboat. Get an attitude of looking to help, not looking to murmur and complain. Life's full of too many opportunities gone missed because you're too busy focusing on the wrong things. And then communion comes around and we can sit there and say, it's not because of how good I am, how perfect I am, how good a Christian life I've lived in the last, you know, two and a half hours. <laughs> but it's based because I got, the, I got a last name that corresponds with God's. In other words, I'm in his family. Does that make sense? And so if you need healing today, it's not based on your works, it's based on his works. All we need to do is, if you've got something you haven't asked God to forgive you about, on that scripture, what was that scripture again, Stephanie? 1 John 1, 9? I just played with her, you know. She, years ago, told me, Pastor, like every message, they've been here forever, Every message you ever preach, you find a way to get 1 John 1, 9 into most every sermon. And I laugh and I say, yeah, because that's where people are. You know, I, I'm, it's, hard, it's hurtful for folks to look at them and they, they're living in fear because they got things between them and God. Why not just take care of it? And if you take care of it sooner than later, then you don't, you don't go three, four weeks, months, or years with that which should have been taken care of in three seconds. But as far as God's concerned, he's just asking you, ask me to forgive you, and I'll forgive you, and I'll, I'll wipe the slate clean. Because that's how much he's, he's just absolutely adores you. Amen? And so, if you got that, ask God to forgive you right now. You don't have to make a big show of it. You don't have to come down the altar and say, oh. No, just in your own heart, say, Lord, I'm so sorry. I ask you to forgive me, and he will. Because he wants to. He's just basically asking, just like Jesus did, who touched me with their faith? Touch Jesus with your faith today. And see what he'll do for you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we appreciate everything that you've done in our lives and for everything that you are. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity to be able to just to acknowledge your greatness and praise the name above every name, the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that as you have died for us, you've done so so that we, Father, would never have to for, never live forever in, in our sins, eternally as it were in hell, but rather, Father, because of Jesus, we are assured a place eternally with you in heaven above. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for strength and life. We thank you, Father, for being able to see clearly what is most important. Help us to live our lives circumspectly before you, allowing the details that, are, that should be noticed to be noticed, acknowledging your awesomeness, always using our trust and our faith in you. Thank you, Father, for once again reaffirming your care, your love, and your devotion in our lives. We owe you everything. 
And we thank you ever so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And amen. Well, for those of you joining us online, we appreciate you doing it. God bless you richly. You know, we encourage you. We'd love to see you in person. If you live in the Memphis area, come and be a part of our services. We have here on Sunday morning at 9.30 in the morning and 10.30 in the morning, as well as 7 p.m. on Wednesday nights, and we'd love to see you. We also, of course, love to see you online. If there's something that we can do to help you, please reach out. If you would like to be a blessing to this church in ministry, perhaps that you'd like to support this church in ministry and our missions and our purpose to help spread the word about how good Jesus is, then we say there's on the screen some ways you could do that, and we, we thank you very, very much for it. Well, until we see you again real soon, have a blessed day, have a wonderful week, and always remember this, God loves you, and Jesus is Lord. Bye-bye now.